The sight and sound of the deadly Junkers 87 Stuka dive bomber as it screams towards its target. No other warplane became so instantly recognizable, and no other warplane was a more effective instrument of precision attack. For the German commanders, it was their flying artillery. The Stuka was not solely valued for its ability to cause destruction and death. Equally important was its capacity to inspire terror into the hearts of an enemy. Hitler had used terror to seize and hold power in Germany, and no one understood better the use of terror in pursuit of invasion and conquest. This is the last surviving Stuka in Western Europe. Of all of those hundreds of planes, the single machine lying peacefully at rest at the RAF Museum at Hendon is the last of its kind on the continent to which it once spelt terror for millions. The man who fought against the Stuka would recognize instantly the angular go-wing shape. Those who flew in them forever held the aircraft dear to their hearts. First flown in 1935, the Stuka were already considered obsolete by the start of the war only four years later. But their commander, General Wolfram von Richthofen, was confident that his warplanes would prove their worth was mounted at an appealing rate. On the 19th of August, on the personal orders alley area, to rest and regroup in preparation for the coming invasion. The Luftwaffe turned into the intensive bombing of British cities. The failure was also of grave concern to the Luftwaffe's commanders of armaments, General Ernst Ude, an ace pilot from the First World War series of defeats at the hands of the British and Commonwealth forces. In February 1941, General Rommel arrived in Tripoli with the first units of the African Corps. Almost immediately, Rommel took the offensive. The Africa Corps' surging advance left the strategic garrison port of Tobruk cut off and encircled. For weeks, repeated Stuka raids subjected the helpless defenders to a daily ordeal of terror until the British garrison finally surrendered. On the 6th of April 1941, Hitler launched a sudden invasion of Yugoslavia and Greece. 600 Luftwaffe aircraft, including two squadrons of Stukas, were deployed and air opposition was negligible. The SPs protected by ME-109s parade upon villages, transport columns, railways, Bridges. In 1942, Malta endured 150 successive days of continuous bombing. In North Africa, the bitter struggle continued, but with the threat of invasion of Britain now lifted, RAF fighters were arriving in the desert in ever-increasing numbers, and it became too dangerous for the vulnerable Stuka to continue operations as before. The speed and distance of Rommel's advance left the Luftwaffe with huge logistical problems with fuel supplies. Many aircraft were transferred from the Mediterranean from Mordov. The vast bulk of these lay far out of the range of any of Göring's aircraft. Hitler's Directive No. 21 instructed the Luftwaffe at 3 o'clock p.m. on the morning of June the 22nd, 1941, Operation Barbarossa commenced. Stalin had ignored the warning of Hitler's intentions and the Soviet force murdered spearheads. The landlines on which the Soviet military depended heavily for communications were also singled out for punishment. The most dramatic progress was made by the army driving from Moscow. The collaboration of tank and dive bomber was efficient and lethal as never before. The Luftwaffe liaison over. Throughout the autumn, the advance continued. The Germans took prisoners by the hundreds of thousands and destroyed or captured immense quantities of Soviet guns and tanks, although... Disturbingly, the Red Army seemed to possess inexhaustible reserves of men and machines. Although the Stuka were ordered into attack ships, and Hans Orlik Rudel succeeded in scoring a direct hit on the battleship Marat, with a new armor-piercing bomb tailing off the bows of the 23,000-ton vessel, Rudel was able to add a battleship to the fantastic tally of tanks destroyed by this fearless aviator marked a crucial and irreversible turning point in his fortunes. Yet he still commanded an enormous force in the field, and resolved that the Germans would fight a trial of strength with the Red Army. 
the Soviets were entrenched around the city of Kursk. In Berlin, the German general staff began planning Operation Citadel, a huge pincer attack intended to cut off the Kursk salient. Both the military and civilian population threw themselves into desperate preparations. The Germans had been increasingly alarmed at the quantity and quality of the new Soviet army. Some Stukas were therefore adapted specifically for use against tanks. One of these was flown by Hans Rudel, who now embarked on an extraordinary campaign as a tank. The Tank Buster version was equipped with two 37mm Flak 18 armor-piercing cannons slung under the wings and proved highly successful. Its distinctive appearance soon earned the nickname the Panzernacker, also known in English as the Tank Cracker. Rudel destroyed over 500 enemy tanks in his machine. Fittingly, the last surviving Stuka is also a tank buster, although the two underwing cannons have since been lost. After some delay to allow the delivery of the latest German tanks, Operation Citadel began in early July. Hitler knew that never again would Germany be able to assemble a force on the scale deployed at Kursk. He knew, too, that his enemy was all the time growing stronger. He told his generals, My stomach churns at the thought of this battle, but I see no alternative. Impressed by the earlier achievements of the Stuka, the Soviets had successfully deployed their own dive bombers and ground attack aircraft. The strikers were frequently frustrated by the dense cloud of dust and smoke hanging over the battlefield, and by intense Soviet anti-aircraft fire. But, when the conditions allowed, the Stuka tank busters showed themselves formidably effective, claiming up to 60 Soviet machines destroyed in one day. In a single action, Rudel knocked out an entire column of 12 tanks. Yet, it was not nearly enough. The battle raged for nearly 50 days. Continually sent in to bolster threatened sections of the front. The Luftwaffe, and at a stupendous cost, the war in the east was lost. The airmen were paying a heavy price for the complacency and misjudgments of Goring. In Italy, the Western Allies were fighting a grim, costly, and slow-moving campaign against a masterfully organized defense. The German general Kesselring was a former Luftwaffe commander, and when in January 1944, the Allies landed an amphibious force behind German lines at Anzio, Kesselring's response was swift and effective. In repeated attacks, Germans took a swoop down relentlessly, striking the Allied troops and ships. Heavy German reinforcements were quickly deployed, and the expeditionary force was very nearly driven back into the sea. And yet, the shortcomings of the German strategic planning were now laid bare. 1,500 tons of bombs on airfields and communications alone. Three years previously, the Luftwaffe's Stukas and bombers had dealt fearful destruction on the retreating Red Army. Now, the German armies were to suffer unsparing devastation from the air in far greater measure. With the coming of 1945, the long war drew to an end, as Germany was crushed between the might of the Western Allies and the vast and ruthless Red Army. Although Nazi Germany was in its death rows, the bitter struggle went on. Short of pilots, mechanics, and planes, the Luftwaffe still flew. No more Stukas were built, and production ceased in October 1944. But the surviving aircraft, in the hands of men like Rudel, flew on, still doing their duty in the face of overwhelming odds. By April 1945, the Red Army was positioned for an invasion of Germany itself. The Order and Nicer Rivers were the last barriers on the Soviet road to Berlin under the cover of a huge artillery barrage. Soviet engineers constructed Bailey bridges across the two waterways. Against this tempting target, the last Stukas flew warily into their final battle, a desperate attempt to destroy...